U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Reservation is the site of a vital national defense facility and a modern computational and scientific center. But over the years, parts of the reservation have been contaminated with radioactive and other hazardous waste. DOE has been busy cleaning up those affected areas, but much remains to be done. Citizen input is a valuable part of that effort, and DOE welcomes advice from the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup of the Oak Ridge Reservation. The board provides input on a wide range of environmental cleanup operations underway at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y-12 National Security Complex, and the East Tennessee Technology Park. You can be part of this important work by attending the monthly meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board. For more information, call or visit our website. So tonight we have Mark Peterson with us to do the presentation. Mark is the leader of the Aquatic Ecology Group in the Environmental Sciences Division at ORNL. He has over 30 years of environmental assessment experience focused on long-term aquatic ecosystem evaluation, remediation restoration science, and human and ecological risk assessment. Since 2014, he has led a multidisciplinary research project whose goal is to develop remedial approaches and technologies that can mitigate the impacts of mercury contamination in East Fork Poplar Creek. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Um, so uh, Dennis was mentioning the last time I was here, I think that was June of 2016, mm -hmm. almost three years ago. Yes, yeah, so I don't know how many, how many people were at that meeting. So a few, but quite a few people who haven't been. So that's good because I am gonna kind of step back and talk a little bit about sort of the mercury problem in general. Uh, before getting into some of the details of East Fork Poplar Creek and, and what we've been doing. Um, this is, uh, we're a little past four years of the project, uh, looking at trying to develop technologies uh, to mitigate the mercury problem in East Fork. And uh, I think it's really been a uh, successful project so far. I'm really uh, thrilled with the, uh, the work that's been accomplished. I wanna thank, before I get started, uh, DOE and, and uh, UCOR that supports this work. And uh, especially want to thank the, uh, the ORNL folks, uh, the various researchers um, who, uh, who do the real science. Um, I say this a lot because I'm, I'm usually the, the messenger on this kind of stuff, but uh, the scientists and technicians, they do the real work and they're doing a really great job, I think. Uh, we really have some of the best scientists at ORNL working on the project. So I'm not getting a response. There we go. So in addition to all the folks at, at ORNL working on the project, we, we really rely on a, a variety of, uh, of other organizations and people, uh, both here in Oak Ridge, who are collecting data that, that helps inform our, our uh, project. Um, uh, UCOR folks do the a lot of the sampling um, of mercury and water up near the Y-12 site. Um, we've had a long-term biological monitoring program over 30 years that we support the Y-12 uh, folks on. And so, you know, a lot of that information informs our, our understanding of the site. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, collaborators, university partners. We have international partners. We have folks, uh, university from uh, Australia who have done some work on the project. So a lot of different uh, folks, all really putting the best minds together to, to try to make a difference uh, out there. So as I mentioned, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, the mercury challenge. Um, it, it really is a complex contaminant. Uh, I'm a biologist, not a chemist, but I, I'm just fascinated by mercury, and so I hope to kind of give you a feel for, for the kind of challenges that we have with that particular camp contaminant. And then get into the details of East Fork Poplar Creek and sort of our approach to, to remediation technology development. And then, uh, unlike last time, where I kind of was focused a lot on strategy but didn't have a lot of results, uh, this time around I've got a uh, little bit more on the data to show you on our three main tasks, focusing on source, source control in the downstream environment, 
water and sediment manipulation and ecological manipulation, and then, and then finish sort of with uh, where, we, where we hope to go in the next year or two. So I think most of you are familiar with the elemental mercury form. I, my first exposure to mercury was when I was a kid, you know, the broken thermometers in the classroom, you know, and, and, and if you've, you've ever dealt with mercury, it's, uh, um, it, you know, it, it kind of globs together at times, and then other times it breaks up into little, little pieces. It's kind of an interesting sort of physical characteristics of it. It's very heavy, it's dense. You can Google lead and mercury and, and see pictures of, of uh, lead blocks on top of mercury. Uh, that's how dense it is. So the, yeah, that is a person there that's, uh, that's just sitting on a, on a vat of mercury. Um, and those physical properties are, are really, really make it difficult when we think about remediation. So if, if you dig a hole with elemental mercury in the soil, the mercury beads are gonna, are gonna end up to the bottom of the hole. And so, you know, as you dig more, you, you get mercury more embedded into the environment, but better or closer to the subsurface flow paths and the groundwater. If you have mercury in buildings, like you do at Y12, um, invariably you're gonna have mercury in the basements where you have interchange between the soils surrounding the buildings and the basements. Uh, for storm drains, you got a little, you know, some of the old storm drains at the facilities, uh, mercury finds its way into those cracks and crannies at the bottom of the storm drains and then gets into the, into the footers of the storm drains where you have subsurface flow paths. So mercury in the environment just from its physical characteristics uh, is, is complicated and, and a challenge to deal with from a remediation perspective. But then you add in all the other sort of, you know, forms of mercury. So there's, there's the elemental form, mercury zero, then there's inorganic mercury, mercury one or two, the one that most people are familiar with is the mercuric sulfide, which is cinnabar. That's the form that we normally find in the environment. Um, that's a very stable form of mercury. Um, but we also have mercury 2 plus as, as a dissolved ionic form at Y12, which is normally kind of rare in the environment. But at Y12, we get chlorine interacting with elemental mercury that oxidizes the mercury into mercury 2 which then uh, can, is more mobile and more bioavailable potentially in the downstream environment. So even just within mercury too, you've got bio, uh, bioavailable and highly mobile forms and, and other more stable forms. And then lastly, mercury is then has a biological component to it. So in addition to the chemistry and the complex physical aspects of mercury, then you have mercury being methylated by microorganisms. Um, and that, that puts mercury into a form that is more highly toxic, it more highly bioaccumulates or biomagnifies in the environment. It can cause neurological and, uh, oh, wait a minute. Neurological and reproductive effects. And uh, it, the primary risk relative to bioaccumulation of methylmercury is then typically through fish, both for wildlife and for humans. So altogether, you know, obviously a complex contaminant, but then you throw that, as, as Dave was saying, then you take the, just the complex chemistry and then how mercury interacts in the environment even it just adds to the complexity. So, you know, mercury's not just found at Y12 or in very, or very isolated areas of, of the US or the world. It really is a global uh, issue. Um, I, I was fortunate for uh, early in my career, uh, able to go up to Barrow. This is a, a shot of uh, the Arctic Ocean up at Barrow Point. And I got a chance to, to study up there for a couple months with uh, Steve Lindbergh, who's a well-known mer uh, mercury scientist. And I was amazed that up there in what I thought was just about the most, most in the middle of nowhere place in the world, you know, we were seeing concentrations of mercury 3,700 nanograms per liter, that's 10 times higher than what's coming out of Y12 into East Fork. So, you know, where's that mercury coming from? It's because you've got uh, coal combustion, other fossil fuels, mining and waste incineration sources that then feed the atmosphere and then gets widely distributed. 
Much of the mercury that's emitted into the atmosphere comes from China and India and the US. So it's transported globally and then can become a problem in the environment. And again, getting back to that complex chemistry and biological processes can act very differently each system. So you, it, it's hard to predict where you're gonna find mercury issues. And then, you know, it bio, bioaccumulates. And this is my, my excuse to show myself with a big fish, which people who know me love, know that I love to do. But uh, it makes a nice point in that some of the, uh, some, for a number of years, I had a, had a chance to study up in Ontario um, in Canada. And up there, the mercury concentrations in water are well below ambient water quality criteria, and they're very, very low. Yet you have big fish like that lake trout that have very high mercury levels. Now, some of that is atmospheric sources that feed those areas, but then that's the system that that mercury is being deposited on. It transforms the mercury. Again, if it's a highly methylating environment, so you have the uh, microbes that methylate mercury, a lot of wetlands, dissolved organic matter, low pH, et cetera, then you can have these kinds of problems in fish. So even these pristine type sites uh, can be contaminated with mercury. And then over the last, uh, well, in my career, uh, it has changed dramatically on, on how, how the world and the science, science views the mercury problem. It is um, a concern regarding human and ecological risks. The United Nations report uh, just a couple years ago you know, time to act. Um, m much of our fisheries in the ocean, uh, shark, tuna, uh, many of our, our fisheries in the uh, in United States and Canada have mercury contamination problems. Um, so the regulatory limits have adjusted over the years. So when I started my career, it was a part per million in fish was the limit, and now it's 0 0.3. Um, so it's gone down substantially. And so if you're trying to remediate and address a contamination, then you, you know, you're, the bar keeps moving. And so you know, we need to find strategies and solutions for this complex global problem, but they're, they're limited and so good science is needed. And because this is an energy-related contaminant, that's, that's what really why ORNL and our scientists and environmental sciences division are involved. So uh, just quickly, um, you know, in the U.S., um, mercury contamination is widespread. Uh, this is just showing areas where there are fish consumption advisories, and green are areas that have a statewide fresh, freshwater advisory as well as specific advisories. So a lot of the northern part of the U.S. is contaminated relative for mercury relative to atmospheric uh, sources. Uh, over a million river miles um, and over 16 million uh, acres uh, have a fish consumption advisory uh, in the U.S., and that, that dwarfs any, all of the other contaminants combined. Um, so it's a, it's a widespread problem. And it's not just atmospheric, but you know, we also have point source problems in the U.S. Um, many of our gold, gold and mercury mining sites out in the West um, contribute mercury to the environment. Uh, a lot of the Blue Ridge is contaminated with mercury. And then, of course, our, our, our local site with mercury, East Fork Poplar Creek. And, of course, that was related to the lithium isotope separation process at Y12. Just to kind of orient you, because we we'll talk more about East Fork, of course, Y12 is at the headwaters of East Fork, flows generally east, northeast, then goes through a, a slot in Pine Ridge before it makes a big bend and then heads west. Uh, into the city of Oak Ridge. And so I'm going to point out some data from Wilshire Drive and then also the Horizon Center. Those are some of our key uh, monitoring sites. So closer to home, of course, we all know Y12 released a lot of mercury in the environment. Um, that was largely in the 1950s and 1960s when the largest amounts were released. 700,000 pounds, that sounds like a lot, and it, and it, but it's hard to, it was hard for me to get my mind wrapped around you know, how much that is, and Scott helped me put, uh, put that in perspective. That's, that's about the size of a 15-foot U-Haul on a 5 by 8 cargo trailer uh, by volume, which, which 
seems like a lot in some respects, but maybe not so much. No, that's obviously a very heavy, um, so 700,000 pounds may not be quite as much as, as some people think. But that's resulted in, you know, 15 miles of East Fork, uh, having ambient water quality criteria exceeded, as well as five miles of Poplar Creek, and there's no fishing from those from either one of those creeks. So a lot of work has been done in Oak Ridge and specifically at Y12 to address mercury. Some of these uh, have impacted mercury, but were not done to specifically address mercury. Some were specific to the mercury issue. I'm not gonna go through all these, but just pointing out the timeline from 84, working through 2018, all these text boxes are actions or activities that have affected mercury and environment. Um, and, or, and, and hopefully positively. Um, but here is the, here is the uh, uh, trend graph for the creek environment. So a lot of these activities done at Y12, sometimes they're, they're done to, to result in some kind of uh, local reduction of source mercury. In other cases, they're uh, to address the mercury uh, concentrations in water and fish in the creek. And this is our trend line from, uh, uh, from a site uh, at our first most upstream site in East Fork Poplar Creek. And this is highlighting in parts per billion, the water concentrations are in the dark blue there, parts per billion trends from 1988 to 2018. And you can see there was a variety of activities that were done in the 80s and 90s, part of the reduction of mercury and plant effluence program that resulted in significant declines in water, significant declines in fish. Then as you get towards Big Springs, which was in 2005 timeframe, we had a 30% drop in the creek in mercury and water. But if you look at the fish, you know, not really changing. And then we had a storm drain clean out, which had a temporary spike, but then back down again. But despite having some really significant improvements early in the program, in the, in the uh, time scale, time period, uh, over the last, um, you know, 15 to 20 years, not so much. And, that, and that's offered a real, that's a real challenge uh, because we have had various activities to try to address mercury. So let me kind of highlight this, uh, this disconnect between total mercury that we find in water and fish. Um, and to do that, I just kind of want to walk through the water concentration information from, and just picking on here, the upper East Fork site and lower East Fork. This is in parts per trillion now in water. We have about a thousand parts per trillion right up near the headwaters of East Fork Poplar Creek. And that decreases with distance downstream so that you had a tenfold decrease between upstream East Fork and, and downstream East Fork, which is consistent with sort of a point source kind of impact. So you would expect you'd have dilution and, and declining concentrations in water as you go downstream. And to kind of put that in perspective from regulatory limits, all of the concentration, regardless of where we collect water, are below drinking water standards. And that, that's sort of a misunderstanding for folks. Uh, Mercury is primarily a fish issue. Uh, you can have concentrations, and we do right up near the site, that are above uh, aquatic life criterion, but uh, they're substantially above the recreational use criterion, which is, again, focused on fish concentrations. So it's largely a recreational risk. But you got a, again, you got a tenfold decline as you move downstream in East Fork. And then when you look at fish, Again, Upper East Fork and Lower East Fork. In fish, you have an Upper East Fork, 0.6, now we're in parts per million. But then when you go to Lower East Fork, it's twice as high. And that's compared to the EPA's 0.3 uh, EP recommended uh, criterion. So in Upper East Fork, we're twice as high as a criterion. In Downstream East Fork, we're four times a criterion. And so, this really kind of highlights the issue here, is if, is if, you, if you're shooting for trying to reduce the total mercury in water, you would expect with a tenfold decline in water, you'd get a tenfold decline in fish concentrations, but instead it's gone up. 
And the reason is, of course, that there's not a linear relationship between total mercury in water and the fish concentrations. And it gets back to those, the, the methylating environment, the other factors that we are uh, concerned about. So again, it's not just, you know, mercury flocks, the total mercury free in water, whether it's, whether it's atmospheric sources or industrial sources, if we're concerned about the regulatory endpoints in fish, it's not just the amount, it's not just the source of mercury, but all, all these other factors within this red box. So if you have a methylating environment, you know, you can get a lot more methyl mercury in, in water, then that can, can be an issue with bioaccumulation in fish. And depending on the conditions, pH, dissolved organic carbon, the amount of wetlands in the system, all of those kind of factors can, can impact whether you got a problem in fish. So that's a real challenge when, when we think about remediation and we just focus on sort of source reduction, source reduction. It, it's not enough, ultimately, to, to deal with the source. We've got to think about other kinds of out-of-box options or, or, or solutions to address the mercury problem. So getting to the overall strategy, I think you guys have heard about MTF. Um, the, the, primary, the primary mercury remediation strategy for DOE is a phased adaptive management approach, and the first priority is to get the mercury treatment facility online. And that goal, of course, is to reduce the mercury flux in, from the most contaminated outfall in Y12 into the creek and to ha provide a control mechanism as the buildings start coming down to uh, try to control uh, mercury releases during the demolition. So the idea here is to get, I think the MTF is 2024 uh, timeframe when that's planned to be operational. And uh, what we wanna do is to see how that affects the creek environment over another year or two afterwards. In the meantime, we've been doing this technology development to try to develop interim solutions perhaps for the downstream environment, anticipating that MTF won't get us down, get us where we need to be, especially in the downstream part of the creek. So this is what our our uh, our project is about: is trying to develop solutions for the downstream environment. So our strategy is 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 three main goals, three main tasks: addressing the soil and groundwater sources in the downstream environment trying to develop water chemistry or sediment manipulation options or technologies and to evaluate the ecology. And I, I have to quote USGS here, who put out a mercury uh, report uh, three, four years ago, and, and their first line of the report really nicely summarizes the issue with mercury. There are three key factors determining the level of mercury contamination in fish. The amount of inorganic mercury available to an ecosystem, so that's the source the conversion of that inorganic mercury to methyl mercury. That's that conversion here into the more toxic form. And then the bioaccumulation within the food chain. Those are the three major factors. And so our, our goal in technology development is to try to develop strategies for all three of those uh, issues or goals. So primary study locations, just to kind of, uh, again, introduce you to East Fork, again, Y12 at the headwaters. We have, uh, there's a, a gauging station for flow and water chemistry that uh, UCOR and Y12 maintain. There's a gauge at the Wilshire Drive area, and then we have another one down at the Horizon Center, the various biological monitoring sites, uh, as well as groundwater sites along that, along the stream. And um, to kind of give you a flavor for what East Fork is like, I, um, when I, when I talk to people about East Fork, some people sort of get their entire impression from what they see from a bridge. And so um, a number of years ago, um, prior to the TD project, we worked with uh, DOE and UCOR to work with Paul Ayers at UT, uh, who uh, has this kayak system where he has video on the both sides of the kayak, in the front of the kayak, lasers going down to look at the sediment, and we put the kayak in at the very headwaters of Y12 and went all the way to the mouth and did evaluations of the, uh, the soil along the banks of the creek to evaluate erosion. 
And uh, one of the things we, we realized really early on is that some of these contaminated soil layers, um, if you have higher mercury in conjunction with higher erosion, you have a lot of flux coming into the creek. So we wanted to kind of get a handle for where those areas of concern might be. So real time, you know, um, inch by inch, we have real time video that then we can put into uh, various uh, EPA assessment tools to evaluate its uh, uh, susceptibility to erosion. So it should start at Y12. It's just a little video. And yes, I did get this cleared. Um, so that's um, that's just a few a few meters downstream of Outfall 200. Some of the buildings that you're looking at uh, are scheduled for remediation. Uh, this is uh, down near the Illinois Illinois uh, Avenue, and. Uh, so if you're concerned about bank erosion, obviously that left bank is not much of a concern, right? Um, you can see on the right sort of the, a lot of the sediment deposits. Um, you know, this, this section has clearly been straightened, um, channelized, and, uh, and so then you get these um, this higher higher velocity flows that really scour this area out. But as far as bank erosion, I mean, you can kind of see these pipes that are coming in when that water's chugging out of there, it really puts a lot of, a lot of flow into the creek. But as far as bank erosion, you know, not much concern with, uh, with uh, contamination from those areas. Not, not a very scenic area or a place where, um, is is of is of nice natural quality, but nevertheless, it's uh, you know we don't see mercury or erosion issues there. Now this is further down um, near uh, the um, Robertsville Middle School and getting closer down to the gas stations on the Turnpike, and uh, the the two groups didn't know about this, but. They're running the kayak through a site that's been set aside for, that's been netted for conducting biological monitoring. So that's, uh, that's our BMAP crew who are wondering what the heck is going on with these two kayaks coming down. Because um, they, they weren't aware of, their, uh, uh, of them being out there that day. But um, you know, you can see some areas where you might have some erosion there, but you're starting to see some more natural features with different trees and riparian cover. All right, now this is downstream, and this crosses back on Illinois. You can see it. Um, look at the ba bank there. It's always one that gets left behind. These were extras? Hmm? These were extras? Extras? Yeah. No. But, uh, you know, on the right there, you know, those, that's the kind of, uh, you know, would get a poor score on erosion scores, uh, obviously susceptible to erosion. On the left, though, look at the, you know, the, the uh, bedrock and the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, slope there where... We typically wouldn't see a lot of a lot of problem from those areas, and it does highlight that you know it's not all of East Fork or all of the floodplain that we have to be concerned about with erosion. They're really it's really various spots. I mean, a lot of this is is really quite quite stable. Um, you know, historical deposits are not going to be really a problem there. It's unfortunate we've got really nice uh, natural habitat there, and they get the nice big tire in the middle. That's actually the uh, Oak Ridge wastewater treatment uh, discharge. So now we're down by Turtle Park. Um, you know, a little bit. Uh, have bigger fish than blueberry. Uh oh. <laughs> Hope you're not eating them. <laughs> uh, this is down near the uh, in the Horizon Center, and um, 
That's an old uh, uh, road crossing. What did we say, Scott? Early 1900s? Turn of the century. Uh, and that's an area where there's an old USGS gauge that Scott Brooks and the, the project uh, restarted a number of years ago. And you can see Scott there hiding on us. I never got those pictures, Scott. But, uh, and this is further down in the Horizon Center. Now we're, we're getting into a section of East Fork that is really, really nice. Um, I guess it, 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 it makes me feel like, you know, it's worth spending the time and effort to try to, try to address the East Fork issues because this is really, really scenic. Um, and many of those areas in Lower East Fork have very low mercury in soils. A lot of open bed, a lot of bedrock uh, pool riffles uh, that are quite nice. And of course, a lot of this section is within the Oak Ridge Reservation. So um, uh, it hasn't been, it's been largely undisturbed for, you know, how many years now? 70 years. It's hard to see there, but right back there is supposed to be the largest tree in East Tennessee. There's a plaque there as you get to the, on the, off the bridge in the Horizon Center. Uh, it's a sycamore with three large branches. Um, and it's got a nice little uh, shoal. We've done a lot of seining here for fish. Um, so now we're getting about, um, about four kilometers or so up, and then, then this is the mouth of East Fork as it enters Poplar Creek. Um, I think you can see this area when you, if you've ever been on the Greenway in, in uh, the Boris area. So I hope, I hope that gives you a flavor for the variety of East Fork Poplar Creek. Obviously, upstream, you've got industrial and urban kinds of influences. But as you move downstream, it changes a lot. And, and the, the habitat changes, changes the chemistry. It changes the methylation process. It changes the bioaccumulation of fish from upstream to down. So we, we talk a lot about, um, about changes or differences across states, systems, you know, uh, uplands versus lowlands. But here in our system, we see differences whether it's upstream or downstream in a creek. Uh, relative to how mercury acts in, in the environment. <laughs> Everybody's like, eh. <laughs> um, So let me talk about the task. So, so our first task, again, is you know, using the erosion information. We're starting to now, over the next few years, been narrowing down into these very small zones where we have high mercury and high erosion. And so... We want to try to target those areas ultimately for some kind of technology strategy to reduce mercury flux into the system. So um, we're doing erosion studies. We've done a, a very systematic sampling of mercury in the environment. We've done various groundwater studies. And we've been looking very carefully at, and I'll talk more about this, about the historical release deposit is what we call it. It's a very narrow zone. Uh, that we think was deposited back in the 1950s and 60s when mercury releases were highest. And we've been looking at very absorbent technologies, uh, try to see if we can uh, prevent mercury from the banks to getting into the creek. So uh, one of the key findings is, um, some of the primary sources is, is the upstream sections of East Fork Poplar Creek and bank erosion. So. Um, this is kilograms uh, uh, per year of total mercury coming from Station 17, which is coming out of the White Um And that's about 5 to 10 kilograms per year. But then if you look at bank erosion, substantially higher amount of mercury coming into the creek from bank erosion than what's coming out of Y12. From floodplain infiltration and floodplain runoff, we've modeled that as being very low. Um, and then note for the down, two downstream sections of East Fork, very, very low level of flux into the stream. So as far as the, the source identification and, 
and bank erosion um, issues, we really think it's in that what we call the NOAA and the Bruner sites that are the areas that are of most um, potential for, for making a significant reduction in mercury flux. Um, so I mentioned these historical release deposits. Um, when you look even closer at those two upstream reaches, you know, again, they're, they're very, look in the red and yellow, it's very isolated areas. A lot of those areas that were highly urbanized and, uh, and armored along Illinois Avenue, not an issue. But these areas around Bruner and NOAA, there's areas where we see this sort of darkened layer that we think was laid down back in the 1950s and 60s. So we really feel like the case has been made through this work that it's these areas we need to target for tech technology development. So we've been looking at absorbents, um, doing various batch and column experiments uh, to evaluate different absorbents. We've been working on the effectiveness of absorbents with dissolved organic matter and how it affects methylmercury. A lot of the work that's been done to date has largely been on mercuric chloride and, and mercury in water and the effectiveness of absorbents on water. But if we want to use it for bank soils and an environment, that's very different kind of conditions. We want to do that kind of testing. We recently obtained some, some really cool um, carbon fiber, uh, activated carbon fiber materials to uh, evaluate their effectiveness. And so far, those have been, have showed some promise. And so, you know, one of the, one of the options might be to kind of create some bank stabilization areas where we apply some sorbents and also stabilize through mat application to kind of keep the mercury in the soil from getting into the creek. So that's one of the areas that we're studying. For water chemistry and sediment manipulation, there our goal has been to reduce mercury concentrations and methylation in the water. And I mentioned we had various gauges through the creek where we were looking at, at changes both seasonally and annually, getting a better spatial and temporal re resolution of the concentration and flux. Um, and we've been doing some various sediment source investigations. We also looked at, at using alternative um, um, chemicals up in the Y-12 facility that may help with the mercury issue. We've been looking at vitamin C, ascorbic acid, uh, as one uh, approach. And again, also trying to apply sorbents into the sediment or creek environment. So this again just confirms, you know, looking at base flow uh, mercury, that this section between Station 17 at the outflow of Y-12 and Wilshire Road is pretty important for total mercury. Much of the total grams per day comes from that, from that section. So this is the total amount, 6.1 at the horizon center, and 4.5 is a big percentage of the 6.1 in that upper section. So about 75% of the total mercury is from that upper section. But interestingly, when you look at methylmercury, then it's the lower section that, that seems to be the biggest concern. And again, at Y12, only about 20% of the total mercury under base flow and only 3% the methylmercury. So, you know, we're, we're tackling mercury at Y12, but mercury, but, but Y12 has very little role to play at all on methylmercury. It has very little methylmercury coming out of the site. And I just, just very briefly want to highlight there's a lot of work out there. Um, if you can, you can Google us and you can, we've got annual reports, we've got special reports on sediments. Uh, Scott put a really nice uh, report out, showed that we had 67% reduction of sediment in the creek since TVA did sediment studies back in the 1980s. Uh, well, that's really good news. So in addition to water decreasing over time, sediment concentrations have decreased over time. Uh, we've seen differences in mercury and methylmercury night and day get higher mercury at night, which we think is related to bioturbation. So crayfish and fish digging through muck, you get higher, higher mercury, which gives us some, in, you know, that, that kind of is suggestive that we can really do some things in the environment to maybe make a difference because you see differences day, day to night in the creek and how much mercury uh, we have of both methyl and total. Uh, again, a lot of information on sorbents. I mentioned the, the alternative dechlorination chemicals. We've lowered chlorine uh, with using ascorbic acid, and we see a 20% reduction in dissolved mercury. 
So that, um, that's been in a, a one-day test at Y12, and, and uh, I think longer-term testing is needed, but that's, uh, that shows promise that maybe some adjustments up inside the site uh, at Y12 could make a difference. And then lastly, I, I just wanted to highlight ecological manipulation as, um, as one area that we're looking at. Initially, we've been evaluating the methylmercury inventories in the creek. Remember, methylmercury is the toxic form. We've done very little up till recently uh, looking at methylmercury, largely been total mercury. The assumption is that most total mercury is methylmercury, and that we've shown that not to be the case. And I'll show some of that data. Uh, we've been looking at the population, so we understand what the populations are out there. Can we adjust those in some way? Um, just in the last five years, I've found that periphyte, and that's the algae on rocks, is a place for methylation. So maybe, you know, things like nitrates and nutrients, ways that we light and, and shade, um, those, all those factors can affect algae and which can affect methylation. And we've been looking at mussels as an option for perhaps uh, reducing mercury in the water column. So just again, highlighting that, that food chains make a difference. Longer food chains, you get higher biomagnification. And each organism has a different bioaccumulation potential. And the greatest biomagnification step, hundreds of thousands to a million times step between water and paraffin. After that, it becomes twofold, threefold. So if we can make some adjustments here, we could potentially make some adjustments all the way up the food chain. So that's one area we're looking at. Can we change the pathways of exposure? And this just shows some pictures of, the, of our team looking at doing field collections. And um, this kind of work is, t is very meticulous. You have to collect sizes that are similar across space and time. Uh, and again, we've done a lot of methylmercury that we hadn't done before. And so there's a lot here, and so I'm just very quickly highlight that, you know, the, these are total mercury in dry weight uh, in collector filter invertebrates and predators, and then in fish. And the darker color of each bar is showing the percentage of methylmercury. And so if you're a predator, you have a relatively high percentage of methylmercury because you're higher in the food chain. If you're a collector filter like a clam, Asiatic clams have very little methylmercury. So that clam has very little risk to a raccoon that eats it or anything else that eats it because it has very little methylmercury. Um, and you can really see that difference between methylmercury and distance downstream. So this is in fish. I've got listed here 24.5 is up in Y12 and 6.3 is at the lower part of the East Fork. And you can see much of the mercury that we find around Y12 is mostly inorganic mercury which is of lower risk and very relatively low percentage of methylmercury. But as you go downstream, a greater percentage of the total mercury is methylmercury. So, th so th this, this highlights that if we can get more of these guys that are in this system that, um, that have low methylmercury, we could potentially change the, the risk paradigm uh, for the community downstream. Is that fish listed? Hmm? Is catfish listed on we don't see too many of those in East Fork. Okay, so we've been doing some bivalve testing. Mussels are highly effective in removing particles from the water. Um, just, I mean, this is really interesting to me. You can, uh, you know, Lake Erie was a green soup 20 years ago. Zebra mussels have cleared it up. Um, there's the billion ton oyster project in, in uh, in the Hudson Bay of New York City, where they're planting oysters to try to address water quality issues. Chesapeake Bay is over six billion oysters introduced to address water quality. So these guys are filtering machines. They do gallons and gallons per minute and day. And so, you know, if they can take a lot of that particles out of the water that's less available to paraphyton and to, and to fish, then we think we can make a real difference out there. And further, East Fork had a lot of mussels years ago. We know the species that were collected there, and they were extirpated, you know, back during the, the higher release uh, time frame back in the 60s and 70s. But uh, we think that water quality has improved enough where these guys might do well. And we've been working with the TWRA, um, the TWRA folks uh, at the Cumberland Water Research Center in Gallatin who. Um, 
their whole mission is to reintroduce mussels through the state of Tennessee. So we get the mussels free. When you guys come out next week, you'll see a few of them in action. Um, but uh, we think they've got promise by, you know, you can introduce native mussels, you're improving natural quality, and if you can also impact mercury in a good way, that's, that's a win. And so this just highlights one of the, one of the species we've been looking at, the pa paper pond shell. So this is a fast, mo fast motion. I think this is, uh, talking to Amber, this was two or three hours. And uh, we took a little uh, uh, algae uh, in a cylinder and, and shot it into a syringe and shot it into the, into the tank. So this is uh, the paper pond shell over a two, three hour period. Hopefully I can show this. Here we go. So this guy's gonna do a bull rush. So they really move around quite a bit. Um, we got another one attacking from the other side. This guy's just going in circles. I don't know if you can see how much the, the water is clearing up. East Tennessee was, uh, was the muscle capital of the world. Muscle capital. Clinton was where you got pearls and, yeah. And so, uh, so pretty amazing, you know. They, 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 can, they can really change ecosystems. So we've been looking at filtration rates in the lab under various environmental conditions, light, temperature, uh, examining substrate from the kayak surveys. So they back again to the kayak surveys and finding out where we have habitat with appropriate species. Um, mussels are interesting. They have a free swimming form that goes into, the, that attaches to the gills of fish. So you have to have the species of fish in the same body of water where you have the mussels. And so uh, we've identified uh, about a dozen or so that um, we think will be, will be suitable for East Fork. And uh, we're looking at what the available carrying capacity of, of, of East Fork is for mussels. And we're going to be doing some controlled studies in the, in the aquatic ecology laboratory to evaluate mercury removal. So to kind of summarize potential future strategies for decreasing mercury flux into the system, again, starts with the mercury treatment facility. Again, this was our total amount of flux in the system, MTF will hopefully reduce a lot of mercury flux coming into East Fork. It will further, and I don't think this has been quantified, but we're going to get a better handle on this, it will further reduce flux from the banks because MTF has large storage tanks that are going to collect storm flow. So instead of having those high velocity flows going downstream, they'll be released more slowly into the creek over time. So we think the erosion in the upper sections will also go down with MTF. And then we're looking at working on trying to develop for DV bank stabilization and sorbent solutions for those high mercury stream banks. Mercury removal from the banks is not an effective strategy, we don't think. Again, thinking about the physical aspects of mercury, how challenging that is. Mercury, those contaminated layers go further into the bank. Very hard to get enough of the soil out of there. So we think bank stabilization and sorbents might be most effective. And then can we develop watershed scale kind of recommendations? How can we sort of turn the knob on all these factors that affect uh, mercury in fish? We know decreasing flashy flows. So instead of putting impervious pavement in the city of Oak Ridge or in Y12, pervious pavement might be a way to slow up the amount of flow that comes in or the velocity of flows. Maybe biocells, you know, ways that we put in some ways to, to slow the velocity in storm drains. Um, we know nutrients and algae and light all, all are affected, so if we can develop a strategy for maybe reduce, possibly reducing nitrates, um, that may be effective in, in affecting mercury. <coughs> and then lastly, the food chain. Again, introducing mussels, uh, and then even looking at fish management actions.
You know, in East Fork, we have rock bass, red breast, and bluegill. They vary a lot in their mercury content. The bluegill largely eat off of terrestrial insects that are low in mercury. Um, but all of these guys, when they're young, uh, feed on zooplankton and small critters, and they compete. So if you overstocked with bluegill and you outcompeted these other species, you could get a, a twofold reduction in mercury in fish, which should, you know, it's a pretty significant draw. And then lastly, uh, you're going to come out and see more of this. And I'm really thrilled to have you all out next week. Um, we're, uh, we're really excited about uh, some modifications that we're doing in the Aquatic Ecology Laboratory, where we hope to do some flow-through testing of East Fork water in streamlined conditions in a controlled setting so we can start taking some of these technologies and applying it in a real, in a real setting under controlled, in a, in a real stream-like setting, but also controlled. So kind of scaling up from what we can do at a bench scale. So that's one of the big challenges with technology development is scale up. And so we can get a little closer to a pilot or an application in East Fork that'll help a lot in our development. So again, I look forward to your visit. And, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we'll take questions from uh, the board. And then the uh, public will have a chance to ask their questions uh, afterward. Uh, with that, uh, let's open the floor. Bill? Yeah, I was uh, interested. Is there any plant, uh, any plant studies that would absorb mercury? Yeah, there's been some phytoremediation is a, is a tool that's out there that's been looked at. I think our, our thought with planting would be... Um, and this, is, uh, this has been done in the South River in Virginia, is to look at areas where you may not be able to do more aggressive kind of actions. Perhaps you could use cane or something like that to sort of stabilize soils. But as far as like uh, doing, uh, pulling mercury out of the soil and into the plant and then harvesting it, you know, that raises, you got cost issues, you got disposal issues. It's sort of a, almost an industrial process. Um, where it's been applied is more like flat wetland kind of areas. Um, and you know, there's 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 mercury in the soil. It's hard to get it all out of there with with, with plants. So you're just sort of in a perpetual sort of um, for the erosion well. control. Are they doing anything on the uh, put plants like the Soil Conservation Service? They encourage farmers to plant uh, boot, you know different kinds of natural. Yeah, I think that's stuff. a great that's a great uh, uh, solution in some places. You know, it kind of depends on the slope. Kind of plans, depends on the characteristics of the bank. Some things, some areas may need more armoring, more kind of stabilization kinds of options. But there are other areas where it's even encouraging landowners to to uh, uh, plant their their riparian areas to uh, prevent erosion. I mean, those that that provides some incremental benefit for sure. Bunny. Yeah, I've got. Several questions, of course. <laughs> um, you mentioned the chlorine uh, discharges, you know, that help with the methylization. Mm -hmm. um, have you eliminated the sources of chlorine, of chlorine in, in Y-12? Are you still getting chlorine discharges? Yeah, this is, um, the, the option there is more about within the storm drains. So you have dechlorination at the outfalls, at the, okay. at the exit point of the, okay. of the storm drains. Okay. Um, and so um, the thought was if you dechlorinated further upstream, then you're, you're leaving more of that mercury in the elemental form and not dissolving it where it's more mobile. So that was sort of the idea there, is trying to prevent more, more of the flux coming from the storm drain. Um, and, and you mentioned wetlands too. Is, is that a, a beneficial? Mm. It's not. No. Okay. You, okay. Yeah, uh, wetlands are generally methylating environments, bioreactors. In fact, in East Fork, when they had New Hope Pond, this was prior to Lake Reality, that was largely a wetland. It kind of filled up with sediment and had a lot of vegetation. And methylmercury was a lot higher out of New Hope Pond than it is in Lake Reality. So, and then uh, also you mentioned the uh, mussels. Um, you mentioned zebra mussels, which, yeah. you know, they, they don't have a real good reputation around... No. In the lakes. <laughs> so, they're in Melton Hill, you know. Oh, I know. Well, they're you know, in the north, too. In Watts Bar. 
Yeah, they've gotten to know where it's going yeah. on people's boats. So if you go in, uh, we've sampled for years below Mountain Hill Reservoir Dam, and and that area, you know, always was very dingy. But but now if you go there under base flow, you can see 20, 30 foot down in these long vegetation beds. And that's largely the zebra mussels taking all the particles out. And so then your light nutrients and plants that can they can grow, you know, subsurface and get enough light to, to grow. But so it, it really it really changes things to more of a plant based system. But but they got to be kind of a a, a problem like in the sanitary water intake K twenty five and yeah, we don't want to introduce, we want to introduce native mussels. Right, and that's, yeah. that's my other question. Is there a source for native mussels? I mean, are they yeah. still yeah. the natives? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, the Cumberland Water Center is raising, raises them. Oh, great. So they, they get in, uh, uh, you know, a brood stock, so they get, the, they get the adults, and then they raise them from very small. In fact, the ones you'll see next week are, are pretty tiny, but they grow... They pr grow pretty fast in their big size. When they're tiny, they really filter a lot. Well, faster. maybe we'll bring back the pearl industry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. David? Yes, I've got a two-part question. On the uh, canoe ride down the East Fork, how long was the actual video on that? And part two, can I get a copy of it? Yeah, it's uh, it's quite long, and um, so we we had quite a project to get it to get those little snippets out of it. Um, we've provided that to DOE, so I'll let DOE decide how the how they want to. Yeah, but anything we have, they can have. So. Yeah. How, how many hours of raw footage? Did you yeah, it's 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 long, and it it was it was over two days, three days maybe, the first time, and then there's a there's also a summer run, so it's. It, they're large files and, and a lot, a lot of tape. Yeah. You'd have to make sure everything was properly cleared. All that stuff. All, yeah. Yeah. Well, I had noticed that part of it was quite dirty, and I just wondered how far that extended along the trip. Yeah, I, I didn't really notice that. I mean, it's going to have some dinge in the, in the water, any kind of river creek system. Um, you know, I don't. I don't remember, Scott. Do you remember if there was storm event prior to that particular? I don't think so. We were trying to find clear conditions. That was not atypical for the creek. I mean, there yeah. Was that yeah. I think that's fairly normal. Yeah. Yeah, the other one is Kroger, Kroger carts, right? A lot of Kroger carts, certain sections. Yep. Uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Reservation is the site of a vital national defense facility and a modern computational and scientific center. But over the years, parts of the reservation have been contaminated with radioactive and other hazardous waste. DOE has been busy cleaning up those affected areas, but much remains to be done. Citizen input is a valuable part of that effort, and DOE welcomes advice from the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup of the Oak Ridge Reservation. The board provides input on a wide range of environmental cleanup operations underway at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Y-12 National Security Complex, and the East Tennessee Technology Park. You can be part of this important work by attending the monthly meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board. For more information, call or visit our website. <laughs>